All right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I don't know how you say good afternoon, I think, because it's already 1230. Uh, it is uh, my great pleasure to welcome you all uh, to this presentation that is going to with our speaker, Lina Malagón, on the topic of gender and ethnic approach in the Colombian Truth Commission's work, a view of the legacy. Um, Lina is one of our legacy grant recipients, uh, sponsored by the Kellogg Institute. Uh, as you know, this is one of our legacy events. This is a project that we are uh, leading at the Kroc Institute, but it can only be possible with the support and the collaboration of uh, not just the Kroc Institute, but Humanity United, the Office of Research of the University, um, the Lucy Family Institute, the Kellogg Institute, and the Keonofen Institute. <laughs> so we are um, we're putting together the best resources of the university, uh, again, with the support of Humanity United too, in order for, for us to be able not to only curate and host the digital archives of the Colombian Truth Commission, but also as we're seeing today, to encourage uh, researchers, practitioners, decision makers to make use of the, of the archive of the transmedia fact. So again, thank you so much for joining us and for uh, accompanying us today. Um, today we're going to be speaking, or Lina is going to be speaking about the ways in which um, the Colombian Truth Commission's utilized in its methodology, findings and recommendation and technique with an LGBTQI uh, approach in the final report of the Truth Commission, which existed or with, uh, had its mandate around 2019 until 2022. Uh, she will explore critical points of the analysis of the, of the final report of the commission, but also the transmedia archive, uh, discuss with us lessons learned and what remains as a working agenda for future implementation of the Truth Commission's recommendations, which as many of you know, are for 60 recommendations that deal with uh, quite important topics to be addressed and tackled as a way of preventing the, re the recurrence of the armed conflict. Uh, Lina is a lecturer in gender and politics at the University of West England. She is a Colombian lawyer and holds a PhD in international relations from the University of St. Andrews in the UK. Um, she is also a research fellow at the Harvard Carr Center for Human Rights Policy. And she has developed interdisciplinary academic research and worked as a practitioner in the fields of transitional justice, human and labor rights, gender, peace building and public policy making in Colombia and other Latin American and European countries. Lina has been actively involved in the Truth Commission's work in the UK with victims of exile. And in 2016, she was deputy director of the High Commissioner for Victims, Peace and Reconciliation of the Office of the Mayor in Bogota. And for five years, she was the Director of International Advocacy at the Colombian Commission of Juries. As you hear, uh, Lina has a very rich and interesting background. She's going to be with us until Friday. So if maybe today you don't have the opportunity to speak with her at length, please don't hesitate to write us an email. We'll arrange for, for meetings with students, with faculty and with staff. Uh, after Lina's presentation, which is going to share with us for around 35 minutes, we are delighted to welcome our discussant, Jenna Sapiano. She is currently a visiting fellow at the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies here at the University of Notre Dame. Her research focuses on mediation, the women peace and security agenda, and post-conflict constitutions. She's currently working on a monograph on women's rights right in post-conflict constitution. So thank you so much, Jenna, also for showing up, for being here, being an active member of the Croc uh, community. So after Lena's presentation, we will have Jenna uh, share with us her comments for around 10 minutes, and then we will open the space for all of you with your questions, 
for further conversation and just to enjoy our time together and take the best advantage of this opportunity. So, Lena, welcome, Hartley from the Kroc Institute and all of us at the Legacy Project. Thank you so much, uh, Josefina, for the introduction and you know, for accepting this. And also the Kelly Institute, the Crop Institute, the your University, all oh, that you mentioned. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for this invitation. And let me just be part of the legacy project. Um, uh, for me, it's really interesting because this is part of it's, it's a sort of uh, my practical work as a practitioner not only an, uh, as an academic, but as a practitioner working with the Truth Commission in the UK, where I live, I have been living there for 11 years. So I worked there with victims of silence, uh, Josefina mentioned. And so my, my idea is just to have a practical and academic, but also a practical approach to this analysis. So um, uh, we can just start, um, and I will uh, present basically five points today. The first one is uh, a very brief introduction about the uh, Truth Commission. It's um, absolutely, uh, I know we all know, but I'm completely sure we all uh, can be on the same page. And then I'm going to explain more about the definition uh, of um, let me go. Great. <laughs> to the definition of gender and ethnic approach in the in the uh, mission, the development of the gender and ethnic approach as well. So we're going to understand basically the work of the Truth Commission on these topics. Um, and then I will uh, explain a bit my critical view. That is, uh, uh, the idea is just to, of, of course, improve or think how it could be improved uh, for the future, not only for the implementation uh, of the Truth uh, Commission recommendations and a uh, report itself, uh, but also for other Truth Commissions as well. And in the end, I, I like to briefly explain about my journal article that is the outcome of this uh, process. This is a probably bigger picture, but the, the end, the outcome will be a journal article, an academic article working on particularly the participatory approach and inclusion of LGBTQI victims on the construction of the, uh, the, of the commission's work. And this uh, will be seen uh, from the uh, um, colonial feminist theory. That's basically the panel. So very briefly, and as you all know, the Truth Commission was uh, the result of decades of demands and needs for the victims. Which kind of victims? All kind of victims in Colombia, uh, women organization, human rights organization, many people asking for and demanding for truth, uh, justice, reparation, guarantees of non-repetition. And basically, when it is uh, important here, it was adopted in the in the peace agreement in 2016, and the result of all of this is very important because the gender and the ethnic approach was center was really central in this uh, work. As you know, the peace process had a, a gender commission, and of course, it implied that the mandate. Uh, of the Truth Commission uh, included this gender and ethnic approach as a center of the decisions, at the center of the work and the implementation in all the stages, methodologically, uh, all kind of uh, work decisions, uh, people working with, etc. So I will define. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I will. I will start with very basic definitions that the Commission adopted to define about the gender approach. So we can have an enormous debate about this concept, but this is basically what the Commission said. So they said basically that gender is a social construction that has determined the places and position of women and men and adopted a gender approach, saying the gender approach is the tool. It's the tool to understand the gender uh, and the uh, situation, the social relations of power and the social construction of gender. And actually adopted this 
ethnic racial gender approach to say is the tool to understand all to analyze all the disproportionate and differentiated individual and collective impacts of the armed conflict on women, children, young, elderly, LGBTQI persons belonging to ethnic groups. So they, they are just creating this uh, framework in which they move around. Uh, the other really interesting and important uh, concept they adopt, they adopt in many others, but I'm just referring to these ones because they are uh, relevant to these discussions. I will be, I will refer to these four, sex and is the, the biological, biological condition, but not the traditional biological conditions uh, saying that it's only two sexes, just male and female, they say basically there are three configurations, the chromosomal, genital, and conodal conditions. And so it means all kinds of biological conditions will be understood as sex. Sexual orientation, so is the capacity of each person to be deeply, emotionally, effectively, sexually attracted, and actually having relationships with people, different gender, same gender, they said, uh, or, or, the, or it doesn't matter or more than one gender. And actually, they define these two very important categories in order to explain victimhood, um, what happened in the conflict, and was gender identity and gender expression. And gender identity will be just referring the internal and individual experience of gender, and as each person feels it deeply, is how a, a, a each person identifies themselves as a particular uh, gender. And the gender expression is an interesting and very important category in their work, as this <coughs> the name given to the way in which person express their identity. And it can be the real one, that they feel it deeply, but also the, uh, the idea that others can understand as my gender identity. And this is very important when you are analyzing uh, violence, because what the Truth Commission decide is or understood or uh, studied in these cases is the violence sometimes, in particular, for example, to LGBTQI uh, people, where, uh, where the violence was committed against this understood or perceived gender expression beyond what people identify for me. And I think uh, uh, there's another one that I cannot see there. <laughs> okay, I can mostly see the, that one, but it's a bunch. Hmm. Okay, I can tell you the story, but it's the intersectional noise, this one. I don't know why it's not there. But anyway, uh, there is another uh, very important definition. Yeah. Uh, of intersectionality. And this is essential because basically what the Truth Commission decided was to adopt an intersectional uh, approach to understand gender, ethnicity, race, uh, all kind of the different categories interacting in a particular context in Colombia during the conflict. And uh, I always say that they, this, is, this is interesting because I teach intersectionality at the university. And actually, what the uh, Truth Commission did was adopting a very complex and serious and comprehensive understanding of intersectionality. So they refer basically as the structural intersectionality, um, identity intersectionality, intercategory intersectionality intracategory intersectionality. And all of this is a very complex um, and, and, and integrated structures trying to understand from an academic perspective what intersectionality means. So basically, well, it is an effort using academic categories. And, and I was impressed by the academic uh, rigor and the uh, depth um, analysis and, and categories that they use and adopted as a methodology and as part of understanding gender and understanding um, uh, the other categories. So why is this important here? I think um, 
two of, I, I will refer the object is of the idea to create this gender approach. So I will refer firstly to the gender approach and then to the ethnic approach. With respect to the gender approach, basically what we saw was that, um, no, just this thing, <laughs> this ethnic was actually to contribute to the social and historical understanding of the Colombian art conflict, but making visible the patterns and effect on women and LGBTQ plus people, and actually to understand the real dimension of human rights violations uh, in terms of the magnitude and impact. Um, so this is, there are many other objectives there, but I wanted to say that it's basically the idea was to see through this lens the magnitude and impact that women and LGBTQ people received in the conflict. And in the same uh, regard, in the same sense, it actually was included the idea for ethnic groups was uh, based on an um, anti-racial uh, meaning. So what basically they said was that the, all the doctrines, policies, practices based on this supposed superiority of some people is basically racist, a racism. And when you try to understand the violence in a conflict like Colombia, like in the Colombian conflict, you definitely need to understand that it's based on racism and it has to be shown it has to be uh, visible and they have to be recognized uh, to all the society. Uh, and as well is important, and they said, this discrimination and economic, political and social factors are incorporated in the repertoires of violence. And this is absolutely relevant because basically what is saying, the Truth Commission is saying, is this, all of this is, uh, is the base of the violence and the perpetuation and the continuum of violence in Colombia for decades and decades. Mm, that one was where I was. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, that was the the, the structure. If you like to, to read that all the point, I'm very happy to to go back to this. Anyway, I will go back to the intersectionality. But let me explain that this is the second part, uh, and, and briefly, you think you will find, uh, about the chapters, the two chapters related to these topics. And I have an, an, an enormous challenge here because this is enormous, it's more than 700 pages each chapter. So I try just to be, you know, dynamic and, <laughs> and summarize really what we see here. So the first one is uh, the ethnic chapter, and the ethnic chapter was uh, made uh, based on interviews and listening spaces. The interviews were individual, uh, some of them were collective, depending, uh, depends on, on the ethnic group, but interviews try to be individual uh, spaces and listening spaces were just open spaces with ethnic groups. What is important to say here is the 38.5% 38.5% of the total interviewed people by the commission were ethnic groups, were, were people belonging to ethnic groups. So it's a really important number. Even when you see the dimension and you can read the dimension of the violence against this group is, uh, is enormous, but the effort of the commission is, all, is also very important. Um, we, um, I think the other really important aspect of this was that the commission immediately decided to create a methodology to include the ethnic groups from the beginning. And actually this discussion and this dialogue transformed the structure itself of the commission and they all, uh, they work. So for example, they created these three moments the pre-consultation, the consultation, and the concertation and formalization of agreements in a permanent consultation with the traditional spaces of dialogue with these people. Um, and they keep, they kept that, uh, the commission kept these spaces and used them to uh, discuss, to uh, analyze with them, how the process of the truth commission, the interviews, the spaces of listening will be. And as a result of that, we have 
minimum three important aspects here. One is the creation of an ethnic Supreme Court direction. That is basically the structure of the commission. That is, it has four directions, it had four directions. One of them was an ethnic people with all ethnic people involved that include um, as a civil servants, if you like, as, as part of the people working in the Trust Commission, they were uh, belong or they belong to the ethnic uh, groups. <coughs> Another interesting aspect is the intersectional approach had to involve something that the women, the indigenous women, were proposing for decades or the last decade at least, and it is the gender, women, family, and generation approach. And this is a particularity in the Colombian indigenous women groups. They basically say, okay, I accept your inter intersectional approach, but actually you have to take into account our approach of this gender, women, family, and generation. I won't go further with this, but it's, it has obviously pro and cons. And uh, the idea with this was obviously contribute to the symbolic preparation of historical damage suffered by these groups. So it was, they were part of the team, they were a part of the discussion on how to, how to implement the mandate of the Truth Commission. They were basically part of all aspects in the work of uh, so uh, this ethnic methodology, basically, uh, as I mentioned before, incorporated people in teams. Uh, they uh, implemented a permanent dialogue with the people. And actually, and something very important in the Colombian context, and probably important in other contexts, was the security strategies. Is keeping and understanding that the war continued, the conflict continued, and the violations against these people continued. So it was required to, uh, to maintain measures of protection, different kind of protection, uh, protection of data, protection of uh, people, territories, many other kinds, uh, many things were at risk during this process, and it had it had to be part of the methodology uh, of the Truth Commission. I will go quickly, if we can go to the, to the transmedia, very quickly. I, I will be long with this, just to say that I really like the transmedia in this, uh, in this uh, chapter, because it's, uh, it's not the same, it's not the same that the report, is a, that was actually the idea. We have a very useful uh, meeting with Maria Paula yesterday about this. It's not the same, but this one in particular has these uh, four um, dots there, and I won't go further, but they basically use the same structure that the report, but with completely different information with other cases and very interesting. And the last point there contains a methodology of this particular ethnic approach. And that's very useful and very easy to get. So I'm going back to my PDF. <coughs> so I, I really recommend this uh, that part because it's easy uh, to follow, easy to understand, and it's actually giving a lot of information, additional information, even if you don't read the more than 700 pages, it's a really interesting approach to the chapter and to their uh, books. And the other aspect uh, was the gender, the gender approach. Uh, in this uh, particular chapter that is called My Body is the Truth, um, they decided to divide it in two sections, two big sections, 350 pages more or less each, women and LGBTQ plus section. These very clear categories with completely different analysis and completely different, with the same structure, but actually completely different analysis inside. As I mentioned for the ethnic groups, uh, women, they were at least uh, more than 10,000 women were interviewed mm -hmm. and 408 LGBTQ persons. And why this is uh, apparently a small number and actually a very difficult and a number of people to to convince to talk to the commission about this. So um, when I talked to the organizations that basically were working 
uh, on the ground trying to get this. It wasn't easy. It was a very difficult process because it's, it's a population that they really suffer and they didn't want to talk necessarily about all this. Mm. As a result, we have as well, instead of a direction, a coordination uh, in the structure of the commission, we have a group, a gender group, that actually the, the, the idea was to have a gender transparency approach in all the aspects. And you know, this is something that can be critical, it's not necessarily easy, it's not a straightforward mm -hmm. process. You know, all the groups were you know, open to uh, accept the language, the gender approach, etc. But anyway, that was the mandate and that's what they decided to have a gender group with two groups in the end women and LGBTQ population working in this particular aspect. Uh, they use it, so this intersectional approach that we, we, we that I mentioned uh, at the beginning, and um, obviously they were, they had a very clear mandate on the peace process in 2016. So we have a, as well a gender methodology, that is uh, they created the guidelines of uh, dealing with uh, sexual violence, that was a very important issue to decide. The other was the gender policy, that is basically the methodology uh, in order to understand, study, and analyze the situation uh, in the conflict. And basically, they have this mandate to uh, go through the whole report and see with the lens if the gender approach was appropriate. That would not necessarily happen in practice for different reasons, but I, I will go back in. in. I go quickly to the transmedia again. Um, for me, it was uh, to, yeah, brilliant. Um, I was quite shocked because I was expecting to see similar stuff that we saw in the uh, ethnic uh, approach. But this is definitely more sim simple. This is basically only 25 stories there when you open the same. The, the, as the gen, uh, as an ethnic approach, I open the gender approach, it's just this. Um, I, I have this really useful conversation with Maria Paula, and actually the methodology, the other aspects are in other parts of the transmedia. So everything is there, but not in the same way that we find. <laughs> so when you're a researcher, and this is different, it, for me it was quite chaotic at the same time. Like, oh. This is not coherent. I cannot find the same thing. And in the end, I had to navigate and understand better the transmedia and the logics and etc. So you will find the other aspects, but not necessarily the same uh, page and in the same way that the ethnic approach uh, chapter was included. So that's that's what I wanted to mention that. But it's beautiful and actually it's very, very um moving and very interesting. I'm not saying it's not, I'm saying like, oh, okay, the lack of coherence in terms of uh, <clears throat> systematicity, uh, systematicity of this it was quite, quite challenge. Um, and I'm going to the last part of this presentation <coughs> to say something, um, uh, see, but this is not, uh-huh. Yeah, I realized this is not the last version, but it doesn't matter because <laughs> I can tell you the um, one of the important aspects uh, that I wanted to mention was the critical view of the intersectional approach of this uh, commission. You won't find this there, but I will tell you basically what is what I found in terms of analyzing the intersectional approach. Uh, and uh, and what would be my recommendation to for the future? Is that we cannot change the report, we cannot change transmedia, we cannot change what it, but, but this is, as uh, the commissioner said, the beginning of a discussion and in the legacy project, we have this possibility. So what I found is basically that the implementation of this intersectional approach was limited or incomplete. And I say this in this term, uh, the classification of the chapters, women, LGBTQ under a gender uh, chapter, and the uh, ethnic chapter, plus the children and adolescent chapters, plus the other 
uh, uh, not mentioning the other chapters is actually a category, a classification that not necessarily correspond or develop an intersectional approach. Because actually in the sectional approach is absolutely the contrary, is how we understand all the categories in order to explain what happened. But not necessarily this classification uh, correspond to the an inter an intersectional approach. Is this a problem? Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's an academic problem, if you like, <laughs> because if you say, well, you propose a methodology and actually it's not really like that in practice. Um, is a practical problem? Well, I will go to that point uh, after this other point. However, each chapter uses the intersectional approach inside. So when you take the gender, uh, the, the gender uh, chapter, the women chapter section, the LGBTQ section, the, uh, the ethnic section, you can find the intersectional approach inside. However, it leads to an unnecessary repetition of analysis and type of cases. Why? Because if you open them, and I just, it's a simple revision, you, you don't need to read the, the whole thing to realize this, you can find, for example, a lesbian black women in the gender, in the women section, mm -hmm. in the LGBTQ plus section, in the ethnic section. And of course, because they try to explain all of that. <laughs> but it's repetitive, it's unnecessary, and it's really, it's not really, you, don't, you cannot understand and you cannot explain why it does that's repetitive uh, in that. So when I can say about this is basically, um, the benefits of, so what, what I would say is the problem is not the transformation and the problem is not the uh, intersectional approach. What I'm trying to say is we are in the process of understanding the uh, implementation in practice of this theory. The intersection of approach is a still a process, is still in a process of how we can do this in practice. So what would happen if we really implemented or fully implemented uh, the intersection approach? Firstly, it will be a shorter version of the report that would be very useful. Because instead of having these very straight categories and we use an intersection of approach throughout the whole report, you can find only and it's space for only talk about lesbian black women in a particular text. You don't need to repeat it in cases and analysis in several chapters. You can actually find it throughout the, the, the report. It could be shorter. So we don't need three spaces in 10 pages in each chapter talking about this particular aspect. The other a good, uh, the benefit of fully implementing um, this intersectional approach will be probably it gives you a different organization, organization of the chapters and emphasis of the report. So instead of having these, these volumes, it could be different. I won't say here which will be. It's definitely the commission needed more time to discuss about <laughs> what would be the best way to really uh, include the intersectional um, um, approach and giving a better order to avoid repetition and to have this third benefit that I mentioned and is reducing this uh, repetition, we mm -hmm. make space for other categories that were left side or excessively reduced because of the space. So instead of repeating, we can, for example, have one space and one moment to talk about this, with cases of this, and actually give a space, for example, to class. That was the category in the intersectional approach that was almost left aside completely. It was mentioned, I'm not saying no, it, it was mentioned here and there, but it's not actually a proper analysis that you can find reading the different chapters. And this is really important in particular for LGBTQI population because poverty in this population was actually before the conflict 
and it's actually after the conflict even if we just overcome and we live in peace in Colombia this is still and will be a problem because it's beyond what the uh, what the problem is it's just because it's going for other causes and other reasons so um I'm going to say something about my um using this this analysis about my uh my academic article this is basically uh through interviews uh with uh strategic uh, actors for example colombia diversa caribia firmativo other lgbtq uh, plus local organizations um and of course the former members of the gender working uh group of the uh, truth commission <laughs> i try just to see at least these research uh, questions. I changed a bit the last one uh, after our uh, uh, conversation with Maria Paula, which she made really good points. But the, the first one is basically is the adoption of the intersectional approach of the work of the truth commissions implies the broad inclusion of the diverse voices of this population, LGBTQ. Mm -hmm. It really, how it was established, how it was used, this approach really included many voices. I, I had already uh, um, uh, some of the interviews and one of the, of the organizations at local level in the south of Colombia say basically my report wasn't included in the bibliography of the chapter. And we felt excluded, and we felt left outside of this uh, of this process. And it, and 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 it is, uh, that is strange because when I talk to, for example, Colombia Diversa, is an LGBTQ organization, very well established and very well recognized. And uh, this organization has been in the whole process, in the peace process, in different moments. And basically, they say. At the end of the mandate of the Truth Commission, almost, almost at the end, we had to support the Truth Commission to get more interviews. So I was saying, okay, they needed interviews, but actually they received information in these reports, and actually the Commission wasn't using, wasn't using all the information they already had. At the point that this organization felt and can just proof that they were not taken into account. Um, so it is it's something to say that intersectional approach means to still have to be put in practice, just really in practice. When we have organizations at local level, very far away in Colombia, working, and we are not taking the, into account their reports, this is not the intersectional approach. This is something that we have to rethink. Um, the other important aspect here is I will use this uh, decolonized feminist approach to understand this. And I have a really productive discussion with my discussion, and she can obviously say, Jane, I can mention more, more about this. And it's using these theories to understand how intersectional approach is a decolonial project. Um, and I think. I, I truly believe it is. Um, we were discussing other theories, uh, asking for or questioning about this. But actually, my point would be how important it is to keep this approach to understand other in other contexts, in other truth commissions, how important it would be. Um, and actually, uh, in order to uh, continuing the implementation of the recommendation of the Truth Commission, the intersectional approach is definitely an important, um, an important uh, mechanism to support the organizations, the different organizations, the diverse organizations, the, all these organizations with this intersectional um, understanding to uh, really support the advocacy uh, projects. We can go further to that if you're interested uh, during the Q&A or during the general interventions. Um, and my last point here, finish, um, 
is basically that the legacy project will be a really important mechanism, in my view, to give the voice to this kind of organization, for example, that felt mm -hmm. that they were uh, they were uh, uh, excluded for any reason. I, I I think I'm sure it wasn't about you know about the wheel or just in trying to no it was three years trying to do everything uh, in the middle of a pandemic. I mean it's not bad. Uh, I'm completely sure it's not. Uh, uh, bad feelings about this, but it's, it would be a really good opportunity to give them a space. And we can include them. We can use this, uh, use the transmitting, use the, the, the legacy project to give them uh, the voice back that for any reason, I know a voluntary reason uh, to give them the voice back to, uh, to, this, to, this, to this part. So I finish here. Thank you so much. Um, so, comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Jenna, may I invite you to share your comments with us, please? Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's Jenna. Yeah. So thank you very much, uh, Sabina, for inviting me to be a discussion on this. Um, I find this discussion so rich and fascinating, um, and it was a real pleasure to listen to you, Lena, speak about uh, speak about this. I've also learned an awful lot in my time here, um, participating in events on Columbia. Um, and so I'm pleased to be part of this. It also brings me back, Lena and I did our, our PhDs together many years ago, so it's a nice kind of come a little bit full circle, um, from where we are from Scotland to uh, yes. Notre Dame. Um, so I want to begin uh, my thoughts just reflecting on a few a few quotes. The first from Cynthia Enlow, um, very well known relations scholar, who reminds us that leader is a patriarchal time zone. I'd also like to quote an intersectional feminist scholar, Anna Karastasis, who encourages us to view intersectionality as what she says is a profoundly destabilizing, productively disorientating provisional concept. Mm -hmm. In commenting on Karathas's book, Jennifer Nash, in a book review, note, who's a very well-renowned, again, Black feminist scholar at Duke University, notes that intersectionality is not just a theory, methodology, or approach, but is also a commitment to dreaming, to wondering, to imagining, and to world making. I mention these two quotes to emphasize the work uh, of making peace in Colombia and elsewhere is very far from complete, and that signing a peace agreement, although often uh, a lot of in the in in the news in um, even in academic work on peace agreements, uh, it's only a first step towards achieving truth and meaningful peace. So, I say that recognizing as well that Colombia um, has challenged many of the traditional approaches to peacemaking by not uh, deferring questions, including those related to women's women's victims and LGBTQ rights, to a later time which is why I mentioned Cynthia and Mo's um, comments that later is a patriarchal time zone. So in that sense, uh, the Colombian peace process um, ending in 2016 and the later work of the Truth Commission and the HEP have done well to address uh, many of those issues that very often in peacemaking are left to later, but that later often never comes. And so the, in Colombia, uh, they have been working hard to understand and address how marginalized and oppressed groups have experienced violence and harm during the conflict. I refer as well, when I refer to uh, Anna Carithis and Jennifer Nash's work on intersectionality, I acknowledge that there's much work to be done still, even in all the steps that Colombia has taken, and that peace and intersectionality are ongoing and moving projects. But intersectionality also has as, I, as uh, Caressa has just said, uh, the potential to destabilize and disorient. And as Nash uh, responded, intersectionality's most significant contribution may be to push us to dream of a more just and peaceful world. And it is this uh, kind of aspect that I want to highlight in uh, thinking about how um, the Truth Commission has adopted the concept of intersectionality, even to do so, um, even with the limitations that Lena has pointed out to, to us, um, it has done um, 
it is engaged in a project I think that is quite quite profound. Um, not only in its recognition of all of these victims' rights that have been uh, neglected in Colombia and elsewhere, but is also engaging potentially in a project, um, as Kirtha says, to destabilize and disorient and to move us towards something um, that is more just and peaceful. However, as uh, another scholar of intersectionality, from feminist from intersectionality uh, writes, Vivian May, that in practice, the application of intersectionality is very difficult. And she observes that may observes that even as practitioners may aim to use intersectionality meaningfully, how it is practiced or instituted frequently departs from or even undermines intersectional aims. Intersectionality is a complex uh, concept that has um, long origins um, in Black political thought in the United States through critical race theory, but it has traveled in many ways to different geographies, different disciplines, different ways of understanding. And so it is also not um, a uniform or um, undisputed concept. So such complex conflicts, such as intersectionality, are often are easily diluted or flattened when brought into policy spaces that do have difficulty um, in transforming very complex concepts, notions into something more concrete and tangible at times. There is also a tendency in both academic and applied contexts to depart from the logics of intersectionality by slipping back into the very same binaries that it challenges. <laughs> well, importantly, intersectionality does approach approaches privilege and oppression as concurrent and relational and attends to within group differences and inequalities, not just between groups. It is also important to acknowledge that part of what intersectionality has been able to do and to recognize is how other global systems of oppression, such as capitalism, uh, colonialism, operate in ways to um, also operate uh, as ways to co-opt um, uh, power. So by employing intersectionality in oversimplified ways, by simply bringing in diverse groups, um, such as in, in the um, Truth Commission, uh, women, uh, LGBT groups, ethnic uh, Indigenous groups, does not necessarily contend, as Lena talked about, with the power structures that have uh, created such hierarchies of knowledge and influence, even among oppressed groups. So in her um, talk, she did talk about class, so the ne neglect of uh, understanding the way capitalism, as well as colonialism, has, have intersected with these, these, uh, these groups, um, also uh, fails to fully and completely um, apply intersectionality in a way that may uh, be further transformative. However, I don't want to be too negative. Uh, truth commissions in most cases do not acknowledge historical and structural roots of violence that operate on a continuum. Um, so in acknowledging um, and recognizing how intersectional harm is, is committed um, during the conflict, the uh, Truth Commission has begun to grapple with um, some of these sort of more historical structural roots of violence. However, it is only insufficient, it is insufficient only to address such harms that are done during periods of conflict and such systems of oppression and marginalization that are exasperated during periods of violence do not disappear in post-conflict periods. Intersectionality, though, may be able to help, may be a helpful uh, tool or approach for understanding how these systems operate and how they work to create conditions of harm. So with that, I turn to, um, and this is, will uh, raise a question, I think, for Lena, we discussed this morning, so I know I'm putting her a bit on the spot, about how to um, create remedies that are address, fully address uh, intersectional um, harms and violences. So acknowledging, um, harms and adopting an intersectional approach to evaluate uh, evaluate those harms is not enough. One needs to provide adequate remedies that address intersectional harms, um, which is critical to making more just and long-lasting <coughs> peace. Mm -hmm. Taking from another example of Canada, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, while well, it recognized in its report that domestic violence against Indigenous women must be understood in the context of colonialism, sexism, racism, it did not go far enough to recommend structural reforms to transform such finances in family law or other areas where it would be applicable. Also, the um, Convention for the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women has made some progress in recognizing intersectional harm, 
um, and has recognized the interplay between its own work um, and the uh, women, peace and security agenda um, and women's experiences in conflict in general recommendation 30 on women in conflict prevention, conflict and post-conflict situations. So while the recommendation um, acknowledges uh, that discrimination against women is compounded by intersecting forms of discrimination and gives reference to general recommendation 28 in which the committee defines intersectionality. The commitment to intersectionality in this document shows a, shows a disparity between the recognition of addressing the intersectional effects and experiences of discrimination and how to respond to women's differences in agendas for inclusion and participation. Furthermore, while authors of complaints to this, the committee for the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women have often experienced intersectional harm. In many cases, the committee has either failed to address intersectional adi intersectionally adequately or noted it without understanding the proper analysis. But even where it has done so, this uh, situated and material impact of intersectional discrimination has not been acknowledged in its remedies. So I want to ask you, um, based on, on, um, on your understanding of the Truth Commission's um, recognition of intersectionality and how it has employed it. So what what now in terms of going forward with remedies in some manner? I don't um, necessarily mean enumeration, um, monetary remedy, but remedy in a more structural um, way to address and to recognize these four historical roots of oppression um, that have created these intersecting, um, intersecting um, harms. I also want to uh, raise as well the concept or the issue of uh, the, a decolonial approach um, to uh, using intersectionality as a form of de uh, decoloniality. Um, well, I'm very sympathetic to this, and I follow Amanda Gauss, who argues that intersectionality links the space place dimension of colonialism to the global circulation of capital and knowledge mm -hmm. that contributes to maintaining and reproducing relationships of power in post colonial societies if and only if it is also able to grapple with those global systems of oppression like capitalism, colonialism, um, as well as patriarchy. Um, how is the way that um, the Truth Commission, um, that the way that the Truth Commission employed intersectionality sufficient enough um, to, um, to be a mechanism of decoloniality? So I ask this because uh, even inside of, um, even while the, the commission um, in uh, forming and setting itself up um, was mindful uh, of different perspectives and incorporated input from different groups, it nevertheless is still operating um, within the existing uh, structures. So, in this way, while it well it may in itself contribute um, contribute to challenging some of these structures, it is also sort of embedded in those structures. And so, is it sufficient um, in it, in that it recognizes certain um, status quo epistemologies of knowledge production? Is it capable, or is there um, how may it be able to to be used in a way that can can um, can be a project of decoloniality sort of moving forward. And as you said, it's already been, been written, done, so how can we use it um, in the future or use it as a lesson learned to better um, understand um, understand how, um, how, it can, how it can be used. I'm just trying to read my very messy writing, which I was scratching, uh, scratching away while I was, was listening. I had to make sure I've caught everything I wanted to say. But also, um, one more thing along the idea of a de decolonial approach, um, an intersectional approach, as we said, is very difficult um, and complex to put into practice through remedies. Um, but for a decolonial approach, how would we even go further to apply this through a, a practitioner perspective? Um, as you say, in, in writing those chapters as they were written, falls as, um, as many, um, as Vivian May has said, when she talks about um, transferring uh, intersectionality into um, into practice, sometimes falls back into the very binaries that it's intending to combat. Um, in the same way, even in taking a decolonial approach or trying to challenge structures and systems, it is also operating inside of those systems. 
um, those very same systems that were also contributing to their violence. Um, that was long on, the violence that was happened in the conflict, but also ongoing forms of violence. So as a practitioner, as you said, I'm going to put you on the spot. Um, how would we use these kind of very complicated, very um, uh, deep questions about um, our situatedness, about the, the existing structures, about how those structures exist and operate in, in time and space, um, to understand how um, we may apply a decolonial approach. So with that question, I'll leave it there. Um, and I look forward to uh, your response. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> Wonderful. I'm I'm aware of time. I know many of, of our students and faculty need to leave at 1 30. So um I just want to make sure that we have space and we have time for discussion. So if I just miss, I may ask some in our audience uh to raise questions, please. I have Camila and Mateo. Yeah, Camila and Anne. Uh, yes, thank you. No, no, Camila, thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. I have a question about if you know if like the two commission and uh, like the people who interview uh, people that belong to different ethnic groups and LGBTQ I community also belong to those communities. I mean, uh, if it was like the same people interviewing people, uh, um, also uh, I would like to say that intersectionality is like not just like an analysis category, it's also an experience and it's very important because I think like the chaotic part of having like gender chapter, like LGBTQ chapter, ethical chapter is because experiencing intersectionality is that chaotic. So if it is chaotic to understand it in, in that paper, it's chaotic to live it every day because sometimes you don't know, like some spaces are choking you in different ways. So I think if it translates in an academic work or in a, work like the, like the one made by the two commission is because the experience itself is that how right and i think it's important to acknowledge that and maybe i actually would say that sometimes all these chapters are important by itself and in additional an additional chapter will be intersectionality like inclusion recommendations and everything because sometimes you have experiences just for being a woman sometimes you have experiences just for being part of an LGBTQ community, just for being LGBTQ. And sometimes those three experiences show in the same, show up in the same moment, in the same space, and have like a different outcome uh, from the other experiences that happen individually, right? And maybe the difference would be analyzing in, in an intersectionality chapter, how those three things uh, had or have a different outcome when they are together the three of them in in a specific situation, maybe that will help to to clarify better how does does this experience affect you? And yeah, this is basically everything. Thank you. If it's okay, I'll take Anna's question and then you can respond. Yes, Anna, please. Thank you. Um, wonderful presentation and discussion. Um, I have so many questions. <laughs> maybe we can talk later. But the the one that I'm a, I'm a, I teach methods, so methods is always in my head. And, and so what struck me was that there were thousands of people interviewed by the Truth Commission, right? And the reports, while very big, right, had to condense those experiences into just a few pages, right? And so, as you mentioned, some people left behind, or were felt left behind. So my question is, um, what kind of methodology did the commission use to convert the large number of testimonials into its report? Um, you mentioned intersectionality, and obviously that was reflected in the report. But even within the intersectional approach, there was still selection, right? They probably didn't include all the <laughs> indigenous women or right, uh, all the experiences. So how did they do that? And then how did that methodological choice affect, um, I guess, representativeness, <laughs> the, the representativeness of, of the report? 
and the same question can be also asked about the legacy project and about other other products that, that try to capture the conflict but um yeah whichever you want to talk about and whichever you think it's useful to discuss for i'll be curious to, to understand more yes thank you Lins. Do you want to reply to yes, maybe yes. Jenna and those two questions and then we have another round? Yeah, sure. I try to be just, sorry if it's just too simple when I'm trying to say, but I try to come and and summarize what, what I want to say. So we start with the with the questions in the other way around. So I'm sure we have time to, to say this. Uh, if you read the methodology of the truth commission, that selection of cases is not clear. Mm -hmm. The criteria they use is not valid. Uh, they basically have said in many spaces that they really put effort in included uh, cases that can show patterns. And, and, and I think this is the general explanation. But they said basically the, the Swiss Commission was in settings that they, they, they were trying to choose patterns, try to give us a panorama of the Colombian uh, conflict and the victims uh, involved. So it's not why this or no, this particular case is not just going further. Is this general explanation about the methodology in general of the whole report? Mm -hmm. So that's uh, probably not, um, well, probably not responding <laughs> as much, but it is basically because I don't have an response. And, and because I wasn't inside, I cannot tell you the real dynamic they had to, to, to do this. Mm -hmm. But when, uh, as an academic, I can just, when I can read, it's not a proper, precise response mm -hmm. to your question, unfortunately. Um, in, um, to the next uh, question, when, uh, it will be, uh, Yes, the interviews were done for ethnic groups by ethnic groups people. So yes, that, that was the idea, just to put people the same uh, with the same cultural background, with similar, um, you know, knowledge and experience, being close and having the interviews on the spaces. And that was the idea to having this direction of ethnic uh, people. You no, know, it was just to have the possibility to interact and have the experiences firsthand from their own people and not just other people trying to get and understand the logics that definitely is not easy. I'm not sure about a separate chapter. It would be another chapter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, my, my, I, I will be in the other way around. I mean, say the intersectional approach needs to be in every chapter they decided to have. I, I will say that it has to be different because I don't think this uh, in, uh, enormous amount of volumes really help. Uh, and doesn't because it's a uh, no, it's a uh, it, it's difficult to read. It's not in, in paper. It's online. Uh, people don't necessarily have access to online uh, versions of the volume. So I don't think it will be um, a better experience. But uh, it's really interesting to see and definitely an academic uh, an academic exercise. Mm -hmm. Finally, just for this uh, three. Uh, they're very, very big, but I would say remedies are actually what we say this is the reparation. What reparation means for ethnic groups, for um, women, for LGBTQ plus as a result of the, the recommendations of the Truth Commission. And I think that will be, um, it, 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 it uh, falls short because it's only like sometimes we have these recommendations that create a policy, very broad recommendations. However, it can be translated into something more practical. And I think is when the intersectional approach will be used in practice to understand the broad recommendations that the Truth Commission already uh, created or elaborated for us. So I think it's an opportunity. These broad uh, categories, mm -hmm. these broad recommendations, actually can be, you know, put in in a in a, in a concrete way using an intersectional approach. Um, the other two questions, and I don't know if we go the bits we have time. So the other really interesting question, thanks for that, is but not <laughs> not easy. If is this um. 
if really is sufficient enough to the, the truth commission was sufficient enough as a mechanism of the coloniality or the colonization process um uh, uh, i mean we have to i i mean if we understand the truth commission report um products just media and the legacy if we understand us uh, as a project as a, as a result of this of this process and um, i don't think uh, if we've seen this like a final project, the, the, the answer will be no. But because it's not, mm. because this is a vivid, uh, it's an, an, a life <laughs> being, I'm definitely sure the question will be, the answer will be in the future, yes. The idea is just yes. It has to be used as a process to uh, decolonize and understand uh, how um, colonialism is still a problem for. Afro-Colombian communities, for indigenous communities. This is still there. And we need to tackle these kind of issues. And we can do it, understanding this process as an analysis process. If we understand this as a photograph or as a report, this <clears throat> will be a definitely no. Um, the last uh, question would be, <laughs> if as a practitioner, how to implement, I, I would say this, it's just using intersectional approach in a day-to-day -day life. Uh, in our advocacy work mm -hmm. and uh, just the demands that the, the um, LGBTQI population, for example, and the inclusion or recognition of this group that didn't feel included uh, in the Truth Commission report or work. Uh, so I think it's, as, it's a way to be practical and to understand this like, yes, we can do it. We can do it, but we need an extra exercise of <laughs> putting effort and putting you know, really understanding as a practical measure and not like an academic theory or an academic structure to try to fit into the practicalities and the practical life. Thank you. Let's see, I just wanted to say two more things. Yes, just to also just mention some of the things that I think are important is that of course, understanding only one institutional effort as a decolonial dispositive can only fail. Mm -hmm. But I would go a little bit further and say mm -hmm. decoloniality can only be encouraged from within the system. There's no outside of power. And in that sense, it's that chaotic experience that seeks to be tamed by the text. The text needs to prioritize one of the identity categories so that it has certain queries. And I think that that is the question of the method, which is in every story, which category do I prioritize? Mm -hmm. And so the addition of the reports is a curation of the stories that we get to hear. And I think that the real transgression of those very well embellished stories is what do we do with the rest of the material that we have available? that we read against the grain of the reports, right? So I just think that the, I just think that we need to go deeper into how can we unsettle those narratives towards more inclusion as, as you were proposing. So just wanted to make that little note. And I have Angela and then Jamie, please. I think it was kind of already answered, but I just, wanted to make sure because it was kind of in the sense some of the questions that Jenna formulated. I was wondering if you think the lack of maybe not understanding, but the way it was handled the intersectionality in the final report of the Truth Commission in a certain way also affected the recommendations they gave. Uh, because I understand you just said, yes, they fell short and maybe we can of course construct from the general ones. But do you think if they had handled the intersectionality different in the final report, maybe we would have more concrete recommendations that could actually address the issue of intersectionality? And I'm asking, actually, I'm asking this because one of the findings that we recently presented in our gender report was actually that, mm -hmm. that the different entities are not able to understand how to handle interse intersectionality and so we don't have concrete programs, actions that actually address them. 
So that was my question. Mm -hmm. Question of time, a question of understanding, or lack of, yeah. Okay. So yes, for example, and this is uh, something I discussed with an LGBTQ uh, organization. Many of these population of, of yeah, yeah, many of them are suffering of a uh, HIV, and they need support. They need clear mechanisms to support this population. That is just. In terms of health, um, you know, um, psychosocial, psychosocial uh, support, <laughs> psychosocial support, uh, economic integration, um, uh, training opportunities. So, for example, they say, why not having a real concrete uh, measure like reentry centers or refugees for these people? 
at local level in different parts of the of, of Colombia mm -hmm. to receive these persons to understand their reality because they are a oh they were left aside for their families they were excluded of their own families they don't have anyone they don't have families they don't have their own families they don't have their, their previous families they are not part of society they are not necessarily well integrated socially mm -hmm. culturally and economically so why not just produce very specific recommendations in which yeah intersectionality will be very clear in that case and this is class is a is a gender is a question of as, as well of um, a identity so it's all of these uh, elements and yes intersectionality will be a really important aspect to define a more concrete aspect and that's why that you mentioned very well some of them are absolutely broad and really difficult to just put it in in, in concrete terms that will be remedies and real remedies for a uh, for the victims in practice and it will be a problem for all of us for advocacy for <laughs> it's very difficult that a uh, civil servants and you know the institutions really understand that when we put in like concrete measures are actually the implementation of these broad uh, recommendations so we will face this and is um in, in a positive way, we have something to do. In a negative way, it will be easier if they really implemented the intersectional approach that they wanted to implement. So that's the, the two sides of the same thing. Uh, and with respect to the James, um, yes, I think uh, we, we discussed this uh, recently, yesterday. And it's how Transmedia and the Legacy Project can force or can help and support this process, I think it's absolutely important that we translate not only into English, but into a local level language, uh, what is all of this about? What is all of these documents? Uh, and what is this report about? The recommendations are everything. For now, it's enormous. I, you know, just, I don't know if you have read the the whole report, I have to confess, I not. I, I've read uh, four volumes, uh, one because I work on that one, so I have to, and, and these two because I have to as well. And so, but really, really the 22, 22, 21 volumes is just really difficult to read. Um, and to remember to systematize this, in, even for one person, an academic person, reading and understanding about these topics is difficult. So imagine for just people in Colombia. So we have to translate this into other uh, mechanisms. Uh, Transmedia is amazing. I, we don't, I really, I don't know anyone saying that Transmedia is more, it's brilliant, it's beautiful, but we have to translate it also, for example, in capsules, in TV uh, programs, in, t in something that in WhatsApp messages, and I mean, and other ways to put all these tools in uh, more hands. So, we have the, the whole life. That's good. <laughs> I mean, we have the rest of our systems and the rest of the generations to do it. So that's that's good. But basically, this is a, we need to translate uh, these um, the, the, the transmedia and all the products from the transmission into a. Uh, something eatable, <laughs> eatable for for many, uh, and this is our challenge for all of us. One proposal I really like is, for example, the local level, how we create this conversation with the government at local level, with the units for implementation of the victim's law mm -hmm. at local level. Not just Bogotá, then that's easier in a certain way, but for example, what happened in Caquetá, in any, many other places uh, in Colombia, uh, the north as well as uh, I mean south any any point and how we can translate the discussion into local conversations with the local context because not all the aspects in this report are applied to local context or we we can prioritize certain topics at local level 
So I think we, if we have a local approach in implementing transitional justice mechanism, and in particular the Truth Commission recommendation, it would be a brilliant idea to just try to you know, put down the, this massive amount of information and amount of work that is very valuable and very important, but is still massive um, and far away from people. Yeah. All right, I think we're pretty much at our time. So thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining us. We will be having um, today in one week, we will be having uh, another lecture of this legacy series with Maria Gargiulo. who's gonna come here and is gonna talk uh, to us about maybe the biggest human rights uh, data uh, project so far, which was to integrate over 12,000 registries of violence indicators, create estimations for the final report of the commission. So this is very exciting. And the next day we'll have a workshop. If uh, you are do not fulfill the requirements about statistics, do not worry, uh, write to me and I'm sure we'll have a wonderful conversation about data and impacts of violence, even without knowing what R stands for. Okay, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much to the staff for your help. Thank you. Thank you.